right, welcome back. So, it's our last week together. Today, we're gonna hear from Ben for most of the hour. I have a couple announcements to make, but then I'm gonna welcome Ben out here and we're gonna talk a little bit about how you build something real, how you make something that you've created available to other people and what happens along the way, what the process is like um, of taking you know, something that you guys might build for your final project and actually turning it into something real, right? Something that generates revenue, something that has real users, something that um, has to work for people, something that people rely on. Um, so we're gonna talk about that. Any questions on the midterm to get started? So the last midterm starts today. Uh, good luck on it. I think you guys are well prepared. Class overall is doing extremely well. Um, this semester I'm pretty happy. See a lot of good grades. Oh, I should say that. Um, if you have grading, if there are problems with your grade, now is the time to notice them. Um, you know, when we're, when we wrap up on Thursday, you know, hopefully I might have grades in on Friday or over the weekend, right? I don't, you know, there's nothing else to do, right? And they're all kind of just sitting there waiting for me to pull them down. So if there's something broken, I have gotten through a lot of the extension requests for the MPs. I'll do another pass on that uh, soon. But if there's anything that looks out of place, anything that looks incorrect, please let us know now. It's way easier to fix before we put the grades in. Yeah. It's a closely guarded secret. And we will decide it when, once we have all the final scores. So the question was, what's the grade cutoff? Uh, I haven't decided on it yet. In the past, we have used, the cutoffs we've used have not been um, that different than the traditional sort of grading scale that's used in other courses. But we don't, we don't make that decision until we see how everybody does because we want to control for difficulty on a semester by semester basis. I will announce those once we post the grades. Yeah. Other questions? Okay, um, so today, uh, oh, so I just, I wanna advertise Wednesday. I really do want you guys to come on Wednesday. Um, the ISIS forms provide valuable feedback. I do read the feedback on the ISIS forms. I know that maybe not everybody does. Um, it's not always easy, uh, but we, I do go through it, um, you know, with a good dose of painkillers or whatever I need to kind of deal with some of the things you guys write, but, um, but yeah, please come on Wednesdays to do those, and that's kind of all we'll do. We also have some awards to give out on Wednesday, which is always fun. Okay, last couple of announcements that are important for this week. So this is a busy week for us. Um, there's no exam for this class, so uh, that date that's on the calendar for next week you can ignore. Um, I've posted the time for the final project. It's gonna be fair, which is gonna be on Thursday in Siebel from four to six p.m. During that time, your projects are gonna be evaluated by course staff that are gonna be kind of roaming around. So you do need to plan on being there for the entire time, and then that gives you a chance to go look at some of the other projects that people have done. Maybe there'll be food, you know, things like that. Um, we're also co-hosting this this year with 196. So 196 projects are gonna be available to look at, so this should be fun. The form is up for submitting your final project video. You have to do that before lab tomorrow. Labs this year are shorter, and so we're actually not gonna be able to show all the videos. Uh, we're probably gonna ask for volunteers, see who is really happy with how their app turned out, uh, wants to be considered as one of the most impressive projects in your lab. Um, the other videos will be viewed by your TA offline, um, and they'll be grading them uh, remotely, uh, or after lab, right? We just only have an hour during lab, 20 projects times five is already 100 minutes, so there's just no way for us to show all the videos. Um, all right, midterm starts today, good luck on that, and then this is what we're doing in lab, so that's it. Any questions about how things wrap up? Yeah. Will the final project GitHub need to be public? It needs to be public initially so that we can look at it. At some point later, if you wanna flip that switch, that's fine, we don't monitor that for us. We do wanna be able to see your code initially. And I would also encourage you to leave it that way, right? This is the kind of thing, you know, um, we run into problems in certain courses where students are publishing code they wrote in the class on GitHub for people to see. And one of the things my instructors always, fellow instructors will always remind you of is that employers don't want to see your two, CS225 assignments or your CS125 assignment. Nobody cares, right? A project like this, on the other hand, that you did from scratch with some help from us is a great thing to share with employers, right? Um, you know, it's totally different. It's not cookie cutter. We didn't give you 
a description of actually exactly what needed to be done. It's not like the 73rd implementation of a linked list in C++ that they're gonna look at that day. Um, so this is, this is stuff that you're welcome to, to share. Questions? Okay, so I'm excited. Uh, we've never done this before, by the way, so we'll see how this goes. Uh, I'm excited to welcome out Ben. Where is he? There he is. Let's give him a round of applause. Oh, I guess, I guess I should move my laptop. So, so Ben, in addition to being uh, the head CA for this class, uh, in addition to being, uh, to doing all sorts of things, a common uh, question among the course staff is how, how much does Ben sleep, if he sleeps at all? Um, it's probably not fair to answer questions about his sleep patterns, but, um, but anyway, one of the things that he has been doing since when? Uh, August. Last year? August last year, so August 2018, yep. is maintaining a bus app. How many, does anybody use, here use Empty Dash? Okay, yeah, some of you use the audience, so maybe you'll, you'll get some constructive feedback. Um, so this is, you know, so one of the things that we try to teach you in this class, one of the reasons why we moved to this final, pro, this machine project format this semester, right, is that too often, I think, in courses, you guys get an experience of writing these little one-off projects, right, that you never have to live with. Um, and so the, one of the reasons why we, we had you do one long project this semester, which was an experiment, and I know that there were times that we got that more right than others, um, but one of the reasons we wanted to do that is to introduce you to a little bit to this process of software engineering, right? So I have a couple of, these are a couple of fun definitions of software engineering. One that you'll see is software engineering is programming integrated over time. So what happens when you have to work on the same code over a long period of time? You have to maintain it as things change, you have to add features that people want. You need to fix problems that your users discover and things like that. Um, another nice definition is software engineering is what happens to programming when you add time and other programmers, right? So the process of working in a team on a project, which you guys are doing now for your final project. Um, I would also say in, in Ben's case, uh, you know, you could substitute the word users for uh, other programmers. Right, so what happens when you open up your stuff and people start to use it, uh, work with it, integrate it into their own project, right? All right, so that's all I have. Without further ado, um, you wanna, why don't you tell us a little bit about how the project got started and, you know, what some of the initial steps you took were as, as you started to work on it. Sure. Uh, is the microphone on? Off. Can everyone hear me? Yes, good, fantastic. So uh, MT Dash started as a final project when I took this class in spring 2018. Uh, I was working with a partner. Uh, after the very end, uh, I paid him for his work and decided to uh, go it alone and publish it as a, a big app. Given how much time I spent and how much I made, he got the better end of the deal. But <laughs> I had a ton of fun. I got the better end of the deal in terms of fun, for sure. So, so uh, wait, that's interesting. So you, in a, to separate with your partner, you paid them? Yes. Was it a lot of money? It, you don't have to tell me, Emma. Oh, no, it was, yeah. it's some, it's appreciable. Okay, so there was a separation agreement, right? Which is interesting. Yeah, we right? signed a thing. It was, just wanted to, I don't want to steal anyone's work, um, paid him for his work, and right. went on my merry way. So, you know, and again, some of you may, be, may confront this at the end of the final project here, right? And there are, are a number of different ways to handle this scenario. I think this is a particularly nice one, right? Um, but, you know, you might, one of you might want to, might think, oh, you know, I want to, uh, continue to work on this project and, you know, turn it into something real, and the other person may say, oh, I'm kind of done and I'd like to move on to other things. Right, this is one way of addressing it. So it started in spring 2018, um, and then keep going. Okay. Uh, so when we finished our project uh, at the end of the two or three weeks, uh, we showed it the final project fair. At that point, it was, it, it was working decently well. Uh, the reason that I actually wanted to make a bus app, in addition to all the approximately 10,000 bus apps that already exist, uh, is that I wanted one specific feature. I wanted to be able to just whip out my phone, open the app, and know what departures are nearby. Because with all the existing apps, you gotta fiddle through a stops list uh, and pick the one that you think is appropriate. But if you could just know wherever you are, here are some nearby departures that you can then look uh, for their, their trip, their, their map, and you, you don't have to know where all the routes are, you can just find whichever ones are nearby. And I'm not here to advertise my app, I'm just, just giving the process of software engineering, uh, is that a really good strategy for, for getting big is to, oh, 
and I, I'm not even that big, but one strategy if you are gonna try to get big is to find something that nobody else does, do that really well, defend that part of your app. So, so you had used other bus apps. Yeah. How many bus apps are there out there in the world? I know that the, so the local Champaign Municipal Transit Authority has taken this approach where I don't, they don't have an official bus app. Right, they have their website, but they don't endorse one specific app. They do like transit and it's, you know, it's very nice. Okay, so, so what they've done is they've essentially said, okay, and this is an interesting choice, right? And it's also probably an appropriate choice for a local transit agency that doesn't have like a big budget for software developers, right? So rather than saying we're gonna maintain an app, what they've done, I think, is they try to say, we have an API for retrieving data from about the buses, where they go, where they are, and then we're kind of gonna make that available to developers and we're gonna throw the door open and then people can kind of build things as they want, right? So how many, like, you know, was, was this born out of frustration for you? Had you used one bus app and then another bus app and then another bus app and then another bus app? You know, how many did you go through before you decided to build your own? Uh, let's see, I started uh, using Google Maps uh, so I have a terrible sense of direction, like it's really bad. Uh, when I first arrived on campus, I could not get to FAR from Allen Hall. It, it's a problem. So I started, tried to use Google Maps. Uh, problem is that it, it's not real time. It, it's, it's great, it's really user friendly, but it's not hooked up to MTD's real time API. So I, I was very confused. I was like, am I at the right stop? The bus isn't here when it says it should be here. I, I later learned that it's, it's not real time, that's why. Uh, uh, looked at other apps, MTD's website, of course, um, m.comt.com is now deceased. It was, it was pretty passable uh, at the time, but of course it has the thing where you need to know which stop you're gonna be at, and sometimes I don't know what the nearest stop is, or maybe there is a better one with a better bus uh, nearby. And as far as I can tell, no other app had uh, that feature where you just whip out the phone, look, walk a bit, and make it really easy to find the stop. Oh, another thing, when I was a freshman, in my second semester, I uh, took a lot of classes on the engineering quad. And so I used the Illini Union bus stop a lot. Problem is that there are three stop points at the Illini Union bus stop. There's the North Shelter, the Island Shelter, and the South Shelter. And a lot of the existing apps just said, oh, the bus is from Illini Union. So I stand at the stop, and I watch the bus pass in the other direction. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so one thing I just want to point out that you're probably realizing by now if you guys decide to work on a project in a domain area, you're gonna end up knowing a lot about it, right? So like, how many, I, I know you have this feature built into the app, how many of the bus stops have you been to? Oh, uh, so one kind of fun app feature that I made, mostly just for myself, but partially as a, oh, here, cool thing, if you wanna pay for the app, I'll give you a neat thing, uh, is that it'll, it has a mode where you can, when you visit a stop, it'll check it off a list and you can see what stops you haven't visited, how your progress is going. I did it mostly as a way to get some exercise, go walking and accomplish a goal. I've visited 60% of the 1100-ish stops by foot. Oh, that's pretty impressive. And I'm assuming these are like the ones that are nearby, right? Oh yeah, I cleared campus first and then started going uh, to some interesting places. I've been, I think I've cleared all of Southeast Urbana. Wow. Uh, pretty decent amount West Champaign. Northeast Urbana is tough because there's no sidewalk. Very scary. Oh, okay. So again, like if you guys decide to work in a particular area, I mean, you know, under, so I think this is a cool example of like a feature that Ben built into his app that's also a good way for him to understand the system, right? So, you know, if you, and I think you have in the past, if you meet with people from the Champaign, you know, Transit Authority, and you know what the stops are and you have some sense of like where the buses go and things like this, this is the kind of thing that you kind of need to know, right? Also probably to help your users. All right, so keep talking about kind of like how this launched, right? Okay, so at the very end, uh, one of the, the features that I wanted also, in addition to the main thing of whip out the phone look, is a list of all the trips. And you can't actually get this from the MTD API. There's no endpoint that will give you, I mean, there is an endpoint that will give you the trips, but not all the details for each of them. So what you would have to do is make the API request and then you get a list of all the trips and you have to say, give me the details on this trip, give me the details on this trip, give me the details on this trip. And this would burn up all my API quota immediately. Uh, and that would be a big problem. So I had to integrate some of the Google style uh, non real time transit data. So download that and try to inter interleave that with the real time data so that you can see, oh, there's these trips, this is the one that's active now. Uh, problem is that this file is very large and it takes literally 45 seconds to unzip it on when the app is starting. That's obviously not viable. 
for a production app, users would not be happy if their apps took 45 seconds to do anything useful. So that required a pretty significant re-architecting. If I couldn't have the app manage all its data and I couldn't have MTD give it to me, I'd have to write my own. All right, so, so pause for a minute, because I, I think I, w I want you to, to give a, I was gonna ask about this eventually, but I think it's coming out along the way, so I wanna make sure we stop and do it. So give us a sense of like what the tech stack is for the app, right? So, you know, MTD, is, as Ben has pointed out, provides an API that you can use to obtain information about buses, locations of stops. I don't know, I've never used the API, so I don't know what sort of information you can get from it. Um, how do you get permission to use that? Okay, so MTD uh, has a really nice form on their developer website, uh, has a bunch of documentation, and it has a place where you can type your name, your email address, and they will be very nice and send you an API key. And with that, you plug that into your URLs that you hit the endpoints with, and away you go. And so, but you also said that's limited. Yes, uh, there's an API quota. You can make 1,000 requests per day without them saying, uh-uh. So to get around this, uh, because you know there's scaling problems. What if I, I get a bunch of users and they use my app a lot, and then my app's going to die for everyone if I hit the quota? Big big problem. So so is there a paid tier past that? No. Oh really? No, there's not. Oh. You can actually email them to. I did get my API quota boosted slightly by emailing them politely. So so and you're saying it's a thousand requests per day? Yes. Okay. So th so think about this, Orders right? So out. it's it's somewhat limited. I do. Limited enough that I have to watch out. So there's, you know, and, and this is something that, you know, if you were designing an app like this, right, and if you met, let, let's say you were going out and you were actually trying to get funding for an app like this, right, and you met with people that were considering this, they might, you know, they might say, well, wait, hold on a sec, you know, how are you going to get around this? I mean, if your app has a thousand users and every one of them now makes one request an hour, which is reasonable, right, and they might, uh, you know, finding a trip might take multiple requests. Now you've already hit your quota, right? So, and, and there's no, I mean, it's interesting. A lot of, you know, some of the APIs you guys might be using have quotas, but then there's a paid tier past that where it says, okay, well, now you have a real app, you have real users that pay you real money, now we'll boost you up and we'll get you like, you know, 10,000 or 100,000 or a million requests per day um, because you're building a real thing and we're gonna charge you for that, right? Okay, so, so the initial version of the app, it sounds like the idea was that the app would make the API request. And so there was no server that Ben was maintaining at that point. It was just the app was the client, there's the back end was being maintained by MTD. Okay, so that clearly doesn't scale. So how do you, what did you do next? So I knew that I was gonna have to make the data shared by all instances of my app, something that I control and can uh, kind of synthesize data for like the trip list that, that I couldn't do without the big GTFS data. So uh, I, well, I already had some web hosting, but I put it to additional use. I wrote a pretty simple server-side uh, application where it would listen, it would provide a web API, is, is exactly what it would do. So I now have my own endpoints. So my app hits my server's endpoints, and then behind the scenes, uh, my server has a database that's going to keep track of some information. When it realizes, oh no, I don't have what the user is, is asking me for, th only then will it go ask MTD behind the scenes. So my app makes requests to my web API. Maybe it will have uh, the data in its database. It'll just remember, oh, well, I already fetched this like 30 seconds ago. No need to get it again. And so whoop, boom, back to the app. There you go. No uh, MTD API quota consumed whatsoever. But if it has been a while or if we've never seen this piece of information before, then my server, without the knowledge of the app, will contact MTD. That burns a little bit of my quota. It'll save the data in the database. This is called caching. Right. And then it will send that back to the app. So the app doesn't know whether or not any MTD API request is going on. It just knows about my server. Makes sense to you guys. I mean, I know that the, the, there's some more advanced topics here than we've covered in the class, right? But so essentially at some point, the servers that were providing the API were being run by CU MTD. Um, and at some point, you know, Ben realized, well, my app's making more requests and I can really support using this model. And so now Ben runs his own server that provides an API for the app. And that server behind the scenes will make requests to the official source of information, which is the, you know, the transit authority server when it needs to, right? So m maybe you know this, maybe you don't. What percentage of your requests are actually handled without contacting, um, contacting MTD? 
I don't have the exact numbers, but I, it's well over 50%, I'm sure. Okay, okay. Like cool. a lot over 50%. Okay. Um, so, the, so the app itself is written in Android and Java? Correct. Okay. The back end is? Is, and I'm very sad to say it, PHP. Ooh, uh, yeah. That is the, the language that my hosting provider supports most, so I went ahead and learned it. Um, you know, I'd basically never written anything in PHP before, uh, so much Googling was done. Yeah. Uh, see the documentation. Uh, PHP's gotten a lot better since the old days, but still uh, would not recommend. If you can use anything else, please, please do. Yeah, PHP is not a CS125 endorsed language for any reason, um, but it's out there. Um, okay, so, so at what point, okay, so now we're, you know, at what point does this, you know, I, I think, at what point did this start to feel real for you, right? I mean, at one point did you feel like you were doing something that was more than a, than a hobby project? Mm -hmm. uh, that would be, I think, the first time that bad things happened. Uh, so, w I, okay, so we're, I guess we're kind of skipping a little forward in the story. For quick well, back. You, no, you can keep going. Okay. I mean. uh, so once I got this, I call it the syndicate server uh, up online. I rejiggered my app to uh, contact that instead of MTD directly, uh, got rid of the GTFS nonsense. Uh, then I got it on the Google Play Store. This involves spending even more money and creating a lot of uh, images. So you need the, the branding thing. You need, obviously, an app logo, but also the, the big banner on the Google Play listing. You need some text. You need to take some surveys to say, oh, my app doesn't do anything inappropriate for children. Uh, it doesn't. It's just about that. <laughs> or two children. That, that too. Yeah. And eventually, a few people started using it. I uh, mentioned it on Reddit. Uh, some people had some very nice feedback. Some people like it. Uh, some people really like it. Some people not so much. That's fine. Uh, but one really nice thing about Google Play is that it will give you crash reports. So sometimes your app crashes, things go wrong, and it gives you an Android Vitals section with details on uh, freezes and crashes. And I found that, oh no, my app is crashing like routinely. What, what's, what's going on here? This, is, this has never been a problem locally. So I investigated and I learned that it was because of my use of static variables in Android. So Android has this activity life cycle. Uh, you start the activity, it does some stuff, maybe you initialize some variables, you can switch to other activities with intents. And I thought, that, oh, my app starts in this activity, it'll initialize the variables, and then it moves on to this other activity, and that'll use the variables. Sounds good, right? Nope. Uh, because when Android kills the process to reclaim some memory, like sometimes your user is going to switch away from the app and then uh, system resources have to be reclaimed. So it'll uh, just remember what activity the user was looking at, but actually terminate the process and only rejuvenate it when the user comes back. But this doesn't actually walk through all the activity life cycles up to that point, only the last one the user was looking at until they go back to the old ones, of course. Hmm. So bang, no pointer exceptions all over the place. So this is how uh, I learned that you should actually read the documentation thoroughly, even the parts that aren't code, like the, the big guides about uh, Android activity life cycles and concepts and stuff, they're important. So you, gotta, you can't assume that things will always be there if you're not adhering to the contract. So what I had to do was uh, always check if they're null and reinitialize them, like the volley request queue that a lot of you are using has to uh, be put back if it somehow. So there's, you know, again, there's this interesting lesson. I mean, one of the reasons we're talking to Penn is to think about some of these things that, you know, are stumbling blocks, right? When you're actually trying to build something for real people, which is that people do things with it that you didn't expect, right? You know, it's very hard. I mean, I'm sure some of you guys are trying this or starting to realize this when you're using your own app, right? Your partner will be like, oh, it crashed for me. And then you'll be like, I don't, how? You know, what, what did you do, right? How do I reproduce the exact series of steps that it took to get to that point? Um, there's a huge amount of effort that goes into this in, in big companies. There's actually something that's called, called monkey testing that some companies will do where literally, and I'm not, I mean, this is not a, an, an inaccurate approximation of how this works. They take your app, they open it, and then they just start doing random things, right? I'm serious. They just push, it's a, it's a program that does it, not a person, right? The idea behind monkey testing is that it's supposed to be like if a monkey was using your app. Right, what would it do? It would just like bang on stuff, you know, open random menus, put in random text. And the goal is to see if it will crash, right? See if I can get your app to crash, and then if, I, if it does, then I have also a really nice set of actions that it will take to get to that point, right? So I can reproduce it for you. So here's what the monkey found. If you open this screen and then this screen and then click on this button and then go back to the other screen, that causes a crash, right? Um, but it's really, really hard, right? I mean, uh, to, you know, to anticipate all the different ways that people are going to use something that you build. 
One really nice thing about the Google Play Store is that when you upload a compiled version of your app before publishing it, it'll put it through this kind of testing. You can see the videos. Uh, and it's, it's really helpful. Like, I see, oh, on really old versions of Android, uh, it, it can't even get to the very first screen because for some reason the first network request fails. Turns out, uh, also, backward compatibility is a really big thing in software development. Uh, there's a lot of shiny new stuff, but alas, sometimes you can't use it because you have to support systems and users that are on old tech, like Android 4.0 uh, wasn't compatible with uh, the, the security protocols used to contact the server. Mm -hmm. So that took some fiddling to get around, and that was revealed by Firebase testing on a bunch of different versions of Android. Cool. All right, keep going on the chronology. OK. Uh, so I guess if we skip back a little bit, another thing about compatibility across different devices is, uh, is DPI, dots per inch. Uh, Android devices have wildly varying screen sizes, varying uh, resolution. And sometimes the amount of UI that you can get on one screen is really small. Like, there are devices that are so small, how do you see anything? But uh, you got to make the app work, and this takes a lot of testing. I had both an emulator. This is a really good feature of emulators. Even if you use a real phone uh, for uh, quick development, like iterate, being able to iterate real quick, super important. Highly recommend. But also use emulators that let you vary the conditions to make sure your app is actually usable when the screen is small, and so things aren't like overlapping each other and stuff. Yeah, and particularly important for a bus app, right, where a map is a big part of the yeah. API. So uh, let's remember my uh, things I want to talk about. Another really important thing about the Syndicate server was that it allows me to make changes without having to redeploy uh, the app on the Google Play Store, because that takes a while. It takes like 24 hours about to publish a new version. Sometimes things break. Uh, things happen that I wasn't expecting from the MTD API, uh, like when the daylight savings time changeover happened. Uh, stuff changed, and my app was like, blah, and it, it crashed. Big problem. Never had that problem before. <laughs> Big problem for my users, obviously. And if I hadn't been able to push an update soon, I would have been pretty sunk. Fortunately, I was able to change the code on my server to translate from the MTD API to something that my app understood better and wouldn't choke on. Yeah, yeah the, um, you know, and so the other, the other problem once you actually start to, you know, this is particularly true of, of phone apps. I mean, web apps are great, because like as soon as you change the code, the next time somebody comes to the page, they're gonna get the new site, right? But with an Android app, um, you know, months can go by, right? I mean, users just ignore updates. Right? I mean, some of you probably right now on your Android phones, your iOS phones, have some screen where it's like there are 82 highly critical updates that you're supposed to install. And it's just like, uh, you know, I'll get to that tomorrow, right? So um, they've actually done these studies on Android itself. So the underlying software that runs on your an Android device is maintained by your phone provider. And some phone providers are really bad at releasing new versions of Android. So. Um, and Google finds this incredibly frustrating. I've talked to some of the people that work on Android there, because when there's a security vulnerability on Android, they fix it really quickly. But then Verizon will take like six months to roll out a new update to all their users. And so in that period of time, they've got all these devices out there in the world that are vulnerable to this particular problem, right? Um, and so, you know, when, when you, it, it, it's, it's so, I mean, iterating, being able to build new things and change them quickly is like, such a, a fun part of being a programmer, right? But the reality of building things for people to re use in the wild is that if you build it, you're probably going to be stuck with it for a long, long time, right? I was reading, you know, a friend of mine is, is involved with development of the Go programming language, and, you know, he pointed out that an earlier version of a Go library had a split function. So you guys remember Java's split function, right? You know, I can take a string and I can split it based on a delimiter. Um, the split function that had shipped in, in Go had a particular uh, behavior that was in line with the specification but wasn't always what people were expecting. And his point is that once you have that and once you've shipped it, you can't just change it later, right? They can't just decide, well, the split function's gonna work differently because there's all sorts of apps that have been written, some of the things you guys have probably written that are, that are dependent on that behavior. So, you know, whenever you build something and people start to use it, whether it's a particular version of an API or a particular app with a particular layout or a particular functionality, um, the probability that you're gonna have to live with that is pretty high, right? And I think, you know, that's one of these things, you know, you think about, it's incredibly fun to build software because it's so fast, right? I mean, there's no, 
I mean, if you're in mechanical engineering, you can't just like go put up a bridge in two weeks, right? That just doesn't work that way. You guys can build an app and deploy it in two weeks. That's a thing. But the downside of that is that you better be ready to uh, support that for a long time or just make people angry, right? <laughs> Which is the other option. Um, okay, sorry. Oh, no, you're good. Good stuff. So another uh, thing that requires constant maintenance, continuing to, to engineer the software, uh, is what happens when the API you rely on goes down? Y now, I, I have users, and they probably wouldn't be super pleased if I said, well, it's not my problem, it's MCD. Uh, so uh, it, actually, this is happening this weekend, and in fact, right now, this morning, I had to fiddle with it a bit. Uh, so MTD is not currently providing departure and real-time information for several really important routes, uh, yellow, silver, Illini, uh, blue, brown. And so if you use most apps, you just don't see these departures. So people are thinking on Reddit, are, are these buses still running? What's going on? Oh, I saw that today. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I'm guessing this is some sort of mismatch in their database that leads to uh, data just not getting turned. But anyway, details aside. I have to fix this somehow, because one way or another, my users have to be able to got, they gotta get there, as MTD says. Uh, so a, b a benefit of the, the syndicate server is that my app doesn't contact MTD directly. I don't have to rely on whatever MTD is doing. I can kind of mix stuff into the stream as it goes along. So MTD, it turns out, has an undocumented API endpoint that is still partially working. So uh, hack on that for a bit and manage to get at least some information from these other routes, get that into my database, which is then going to be picked up by the, the part, the endpoint on my server that the app hits. And so things are more or less uh, working services, partially restored, and things will get more back to normal once MTD is fixed. But got to keep working in the meantime. This has also helped me when, uh, say, some text is inconsistent from MTD, like they change the, the hopper head signs says, you know, gold hopper in all caps for part of it, or gold space hopper in some of the cases. So that's kind of inconsistent, looks a little weird. So I can just go into my database and fiddle that and make it look right. Reality can be whatever I want. The, uh, so what, what's it been like interacting with, with users? Okay, uh, so people on Reddit have given some uh, really helpful uh, feedback. Like how do people get in touch with you? Is there like a standard way that they, is there feedback built into the app? Do you, like, do they leave comments? I mean, I'm, I've seen people leaving some ratings and comments on the, the Google Play site. Like, what's the primary vehicle that you have for receiving feedback from users? Um, I think most of my feedback is, is actually from uh, people saying stuff on Reddit. I do have a, a feedback mechanism in the app. You can go to the menu and choose Give Feedback, and I do, actually, literally all the feedback I've received through that mechanism is people accidentally typing a blank thing and pressing the button. <laughs> so that's fine. <laughs> Uh, but the, I also read the Google Play reviews, of course, uh, and people have yeah. said some nice things and gotten some really helpful feedback on, again, uh, yeah, Reddit. About 75% about of the feedback that comes in through our anonymous feedback form is people trying to get me to buy stuff from Russia. Um, <laughs> so, um, Cool, so we have like 15 minutes left. Um, let me, I got a few questions on the forum. Let me grab one of these. Um, yeah, okay, so I, th this is one of the things I think is, is interesting. So, so what about the, like, the monetization aspect of this? You have a paid version of the app, mm -hmm. uh, and is that popular? No. Uh, <laughs> I did it uh, mostly because, you know, some people really don't like ads. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of ads uh, myself. I put them in because I want to try to recoup a little bit of the money because, you know, I'm spending on servers I spent uh, to put this thing on the Google Play Store. Not getting rich from it, obviously. Uh, but just another option for people if they prefer that, give people some cool stuff like the, uh, the adventure mode uh, is mostly why I did that. The, uh, so you monetize it through ads and then there's a paid version as well. Right. The so what is that like, I'm, I've never done this, I'm curious, like well, oh. how does this work? Does it slow down the app a lot? I mean, if you had to tangle with like, what are the choices like in this area? You know, how does the revenue stream work? Like, do you have any sense of like, whether or not you're getting the correct amount of revenue? Mm -hmm. Okay, so Google provides an SDK uh, to help you uh, monetize your app with uh, ads. It's called AdMod. So what you do is you install this into your project. It's a Gradle dependency. And you can add views in certain places in your app where you would like there to be a uh, banner ad. They also have like interstitial ads, but those are, that feels wrong to me, so I'm not gonna do that <laughs> to my users. 
Uh, if you just sprinkle these uh, around tastefully, or I mean, hopefully you do it tastefully. I try to do it tastefully. Uh, and of course, be careful that you don't put it uh, too close to a thing that a user might want to click if they're not looking for the ad. Uh, try to keep it away from buttons, add a little bit of a margin. And you put it, like if you're using the Google Maps SDK, some of you are for your final projects, there's an API key that you embed in your manifest or some XML file, likewise for AdMob. And this associates it with your account online. And eventually, um, this took like over a year for me to make any sort of money whatsoever. <laughs> uh, eventually, they will ask you to put in your payment information. They'll just um, send it right into your bank account. Cool. Does anyone here have any questions for Ben before we have a couple more things? But yeah. So the question was like, you know, Ben uh, is actually majoring in, in MCV, uh, turns out. Um, so the question is, how did you get into CS? Okay. So I was actually a programmer much before I uh, went into biology. So dad started me uh, learning GW Basic on a Tandy 1000, a very long time ago. Uh, and I, I loved it. I eventually moved up to better languages. <laughs> I don't know anything about GW Basic. It's, it's really something. <laughs> but yeah, I, I love building things. It's just so much fun. And I, I kept at it even when I decided to switch my primary uh, objective to biology because computer science applies, well, more software engineering, applies to absolutely everything. Like, uh, it's, it is really today's modern superpower. And Jeff isn't paying me to say this, but I legitimately believe that 125 is the single most worthwhile class you can take at Illinois. Uh, because it gives you really powerful tools that you can apply to do a lot of stuff in, in any discipline. So, for example, in the, the biology lab, they had some DNA sequencing data that they, they couldn't work with because they are biologists. So, uh, fortunately, I have a bit of background in computing, writing scripts and programs and such, so I was able to write a program that got the data they want. And this has been enormously helpful uh, in biology research even outside of pure computer science classes like this. Good question. And it, as for how I got into it, mostly just wanting to build something. I saw something that I want to make that. Um, just, just like this app, actually. I wanted a feature, so I, I pursued it. In other areas, I wanted a tool, so I, I, I built it, learning along the way. There was a lot of struggles, a lot of documentation reading, so much Googling, a lot of crashes. Crashes never go away. You will always write programs that crash. I constantly write programs that crash. But you get better at debugging and fixing it and building great stuff. Great question. Other questions? I have another. Oh, yeah. This is a great question, so I'll, I'll just repeat it. So the question is how do you know you're done? How do you know it's ready to walk out the door? That's tough. Uh, there is almost always more stuff you could add. But there's this concept called the minimum viable product. Like, does it do something useful that, uh, that couldn't be done uh, before? If, it, if you have that feature, that really killer feature that you really want implemented, and it doesn't crash, like you've tested it on a variety of emulators, you've put it through uh, Google's Firebase testing, if, if that's your thing, uh, if it works as far as you can tell and it's ready to scale, then, then go for it. You can always uh, iterate later, especially if you've uh, planned well for that, like having a, a server that you can change quick. So minimum viable product and yeah, ability question, to squint. I mean, I think, I think part of the answer to that too is, you know, particularly for you guys as you're learning, right, I would say earlier is better, right? Wor you know, remember the, the Mark Andreessen quote, you know, worse is better, right? Like don't, I, I tend to be this way. I tend to hold on to stuff because I'm trying to kind of make it perfect, but I think one of the things I like about what Ben did is he just like launched the app, and then he found out it was crashing. And I was like, oh, I'm gonna fix it, right? Um, and it turns out that, you know, like a lot of users are, are patient enough that they'll kind of work through that. And if the app does something useful, in fact, it crashes a little bit, they'll report it, and then if you have some time to work on it, you can iterate it. But, but I think, you know, there's this sense where it's like, I'm scared of what's gonna happen when I deploy it, right? I'm nervous, and so you hold back a little bit, but you're never gonna have that experience if you don't do it, and it's kind of like, you know, whatever, right? You know, if it crashes on a few devices, maybe it crashes on everyone's device. Maybe it's a terrible app, right? 
and like it's not you know it's not the last one you're going to build, right? Which actually brings me to to another question I wanted to ask, which is, what's the future of MT Dash? You know, we've got a bunch of users in here, right? I mean, they're not graduating this next semester, so right. you know, what's the what's the plan going forward? Are you going to continue to support this into the into the twilight? Yeah, I, I certainly want to uh, keep it going. I can obviously I'll be leaving campus uh, next year, but uh, I can continue making sure occasionally. Oh, is, is the app running? I can. Oh, another thing in response to how do you get feedback? Uh, my server has logs too, so if, if things are going wrong, I can tell there. Uh, if there's uh, things like departures not showing up, I might have to try to get someone to inform me if there are issues. Um, someone to write the alerts that I can put out. Like, uh, oh, another mechanism I have for user communication is uh, my app will check with my server, hey, is there any message you want me to show? And if so, it'll just throw that up as a modal dialogue the user has to, to see oh, cool. to let them know if something's going wrong or if they should be aware of anything. Uh, in terms of features, um, I'm working on a vehicle lookup uh, Things so you can, okay. So if you live at PAR, anyone live at PAR? Par, few. Par. Okay, not far. very much. That's all right. Uh, it's the origin for a lot of routes, and sometimes buses will have their head signs set to not in service before they actually get going from there. But you're wondering which bus am I getting on again? Like, is it here yet? Did I miss it? What's go what's going on? Uh, so if you could just punch in the vehicle number and see, oh, it's about to depart X Y Z in however many minutes, I think that'd be pretty cool. I have like half the infrastructure ready, but haven't uh, put the UI on it yet. Cool. All right, any other questions? We're almost in time for today. What you need to add is a driver search, actually. That's what I want. Some of the drivers are better than others. Oh, yeah, there's this guy on the Raven. Or he's not on the Raven anymore. He was fantastic. He's yeah, my favorite. there's a woman that used to drive the bus I used to take. All right, going once, going twice. All right, well, let's thank Ben for coming in and taking his time. And <laughs> also, of course, you can thank him or, you know, uh, for the, all the work he did on the machine project this semester, too, right, which you guys really benefited from. So, Cool. All right. Well, good luck on the uh, midterm, uh, everyone. And I will see you guys back here on Wednesday to wrap up and do the ISIS forms. So 